Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the program, I'll be talking to the UN rapporteur on Palestine, John Dugard, discussing the football World Cup and latest developments, and the price of oil as well, and meeting supermodel Sophie Dahl. But first of all, Pakistan and Benazir Bhutto. When the former Prime Minister arrived back in the country two weeks ago, after eight years in exile, the homecoming parade in Karachi was quite literally blown apart by an assassination attempt. A suicide bomber exploded a bomb meters from Ms. Bhutto's open-top bus and killed more than 130 people. Benazir Bhutto joins us now. Benazir, hello and welcome. Thank you, David. Tell me, has that terrible assassination attempt uh, affected your decision to carry on with this battle? No, it's uh, that uh, horrific incident in which uh, 158 innocent young men, a woman, a baby lost their lives has just made me do more determined to continue. I do believe Pakistan is under increasing threat of an extremist takeover. And to save the country, I believe we must restore democracy, get the people's faith in the country, moving the country forward. So I'm determined to go ahead with the mission to save Pakistan with democracy. And, and how, do your, how do your children feel about this? They're old enough now to know the risks you've got to take. This is one of the reasons that I traveled from Karachi to Dubai. I wanted to console my children. I couldn't come immediately after the bomb blast because we had to tend to the wounded and also condole with the families, and I had to pray at my father's grave. But I came here to be with them. They were asleep when the midnight blasts uh, took place, and in the morning they got text messages from their friends saying, we hope your mother is well. They were pretty upset. And then uh, their father came into the room and said, I have something to tell you. And they said, well, Dad, we already know. They're coping, but obviously they worry. They do want me to continue, though. They understand that I'm doing this for their country and for all the people of Pakistan. That's a, that's a marvelous story because it underlines the way that our children these days get their information almost before we do. That's right. And not only uh, our children, but what has really, uh, in a sense, I'm overwhelmed and in a bit also uh, feel a tremendous uh, sense of responsibility, a burden of responsibility, because one of the mothers who lost her sons in this uh, terrorist attack that took place in Karachi has just volunteered her other son to join up as one of my security guards in Rawal Pindi. And when our party boys told her she didn't have to do it because she just lost one son, and the mother turned around and said, the only hope that we have is that she succeeds. And that's the reason why I want to send my second son to be her security guard too. That's very, that's very courageous indeed. Tell me, um, do you know yet, does anyone know exactly who was responsible for this assassination attempt? There was one report that said that you had arranged to send President Musharraf a letter to be sent in the event of your death by assassination, urging him to investigate certain individuals in his government. Is that true? Yes, it is true that I wrote to General Musharraf. I received um, information from um, General Musharraf that a friendly country had passed on to them the information that I could be attacked by a gang from the Afghan uh, warlord Bethullah Massoud, or by um, Hamza bin Laden, the son of Osama bin Laden, or by the Pakistani Taliban in Islamabad, or by a group in Karachi. So I sent back a letter saying that while these groups may be used, I thought it was more important to go after the people who supported them, who organized them, who could possibly be uh, the financiers or the organizers of the finance for those groups, and I named three individuals who I thought were their sympathizers. Now I understand that I could be wrong and my suspicions could be misplaced, but these are the people that I suspect want to stop the restoration of democracy. They want to stop my return because they know in 1993 
when Pakistan was on the brink of being declared a terrorist state, I stopped the rise of terrorism and they know that I can do it again. So I feel that these are the forces that really want to stop not just me, but the democratic process and the will of the people from triumphing. And uh, in terms of these three people that uh, you mentioned, um, were, they, were they members of or associated with the government? Yes, well, one of them is um, a very key figure in security. He's a former military officer. He is someone that um, has had dealings with um, Jayashi Mohammed, one of the banned groups, with Maulana Azhar, who was in the Indian jail for decapitating three British uh, tourists and three American tourists. And um, he also had dealings with uh, Umar Sheikh, the man who murdered now I know that having dealings with people uh, does not necessarily mean direct evidence, but I also know that internal security has totally collapsed in Pakistan and that internal security cannot collapse uh, without there being some blind eye, if not collusion, being turned to the rise of the militants and militancy. Not only are our tribal areas out of our control, but even the beautiful valley of Swat is now under takeover by Islamists. So I would like to see a park-led police inquiry assisted by Scotland Yard or the FBI come in, use their forensic and scientific explanation to find out not only the perpetrators, but the financers and the organizers of this heinous crime, 58 innocent people. And in terms of that terrible tragedy, have you actually spoken to President Musharraf since that? Yes, I have. He was very gracious. He had the Director General Inter-Services Intelligence ring me up the first evening to condemn uh, the incident that had taken place. And he phoned me the next morning and he said that he and Prime Minister Aziz had been watching my reception from the beginning and were very sorry about the unfortunate blast that had taken place. And also, um, he condemned the blast. He grieved with the families. He expressed his sorrow. But he was a bit worried that my uh, party naming a uh, security official could uh, hamper that rapprochement process. And I assured him that it was not my intention to hamper the rapprochement uh, process. I did want to see a peaceful transition to democracy through fair, free, and impartial elections. But I also felt that it was important, A, to have an independent inquiry that gave me confidence, and B, to have impartial, politically neutral people in key positions in government in the caretaker or transitory period. You, you still feel that you can do business with uh, President Musharraf. That hasn't been affected by this, this tragedy. The two of you could still work together. Well, David, I think we need to see uh, this in ongoing negotiations. We both have the desire to work together but while we have the principle sorted out, we really need to sort out the modalities. Because I'm asking myself how a PPP government, if the people of Pakistan elect us, can actually cope if we cannot have officials in our internal security who we feel have no links to militants and to uh, their supporters. I'm just wondering that if I was the target of a horrific terrorist attack in which 158 people died, and I can't even file a police complaint because the government doesn't allow me to file it, then, well, would this rapprochement mean an effective transition, or would it mean a continuation of the status quo? I'm interested in an effective transition, and I'm willing to explore with General Musharraf the modalities in which that we can have such an, a transition, but I'm not willing to be the icing on the cake if it's a poisoned cake full of the kind of system that in the last five years has seen uh, terrorism rise, not just in Pakistan, but its effects in nearby Afghanistan, on NATO troops, and even beyond in Europe. And in terms of, in terms of what, what happens next, has there been any progress in terms of the thing about you being allowed to have or anybody being allowed to have three terms in Pakistan as Prime Minister? Well, I have discussed with my party members what has been uh, confidentially assured to us 
but um, they know that uh, we expect a resolution of this issue at uh, the opportune uh, time. But what I'm really interested right now is an investigation, a Pakistan police investigation assisted by the international community with the forensic skills to unmask the perpetrators, organizers, financers, and sponsors of this act of terrorism. I'm not saying this just because it was an attack on me. The uh, locality where the chairman joint chiefs of army staffs lives was attacked two days back. An Air Force bus was attacked yesterday. People in marketplaces are killed. And unless we get to the finances and the perpetrators and organizers, we're not going to be able to frighten them into accepting responsibility for their crimes. They don't accept. They kill people and they think they won't even have to go to jail. They won't have to answer before a judge. And that's wrong. And what about the situation? What if um, the Supreme Court say that uh, the election of President Musharraf was valid, uh, but, but he still kept wearing his army uniform? Um, would that be a problem for you? Well, uh, General Musharraf and I discussed this issue during our negotiations. And uh, I, uh, it was decided that we would accept the decision of the Supreme Court of Pakistan. And I'm on public as saying this before my return to Pakistan, that as far as the Pakistan People's Party is concerned, we are not going to resign from the assemblies in protest over General Musharraf's um, re-election as president. We have a different view on its legality, but we're going to leave it to the Supreme Court of Pakistan to decide. So we are going to back the Supreme Court in whatever judgment it decides to give on the issue of General Musharraf's legality. We expect that the Supreme Court will probably allow him to continue but ask him to retire as army chief and seek a uh, reaffirmation vote from the next assembly. So, and if, she, if he kept wearing the army uniform, that would be a problem for you and the Supreme Court, perhaps? Yes. Mm. Yes, it would be a problem for me, for the Supreme Court of Pakistan. It would probably demor demoralize the armed forces who haven't had a serving army chief um, since... October 1999, and it would certainly not be acceptable to the people of Pakistan. Now, General Musharraf has assured me that he would retire as Chief of Army Staff, and he said this to the Supreme Court, too, in an uh, open declaration that he would uh, take his oath uh, as president for a second time without uh, the uniform. So let's see what happens. How is the Pakistan you now see different from the Pakistan you left eight years ago? Well, part of the Pakistan that I know was very much there. The three million people who turned out to greet me at Karachi Airport were dancing, they were singing, they were celebrating, they were full of joy, they were young people, they were taxi drivers and rickshaw drivers and daily wage earners, they were the working classes, the laborers, the peasants, and they all came to demonstrate their support in democracy and their support to the forces of moderation. And then the tragedy struck, but it struck through the militants who are a minority, a small minority who want to use the bullet to capture my country, and they mustn't be allowed to do so. And even though there has been turmoil and tragedy, I am confident that if we can restore the democratic process, we can restore tranquility, security to our people, provide them with the employment and the education that are the best guarantees of a tolerant society. Benazir, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real privilege to talk and to hear the situation exactly, exactly as you see it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, David. Benazir Bhutto, more in a moment from Frost over the world.